after a hundred thousand years, the Ice Age is coming to an end. This treeless grassland is the domain of a spectacular creature. A creature which ranged across Europe from the French Pyrenees to the Russian steppes, but in Ireland it found a homeland which human hunters had not reached. It has antlers so vast and elaborate they stretch 12 feet from tip to tip. They are the crowning glory of the magnificent Irish elk. But this giant deer has presented science with an intractable mystery. Why, having flourished for millennia, did it undergo catastrophic extinction? Were its massive antlers to blame? The Irish elk has a sort of iconic status among Irish biologists. And it seems to me that it's a great animal to study the great themes of evolution. For example, how did it get to be as it is? And in this particular case, how did it die? A disused army barracks in the heart of Dublin is the final resting place for prehistoric remains which have been excavated over the last 200 years. Paleontologist Tom Hayden has come to take a closer look. Stored here are the peat blackened remains of hundreds of Irish elk, which died between 10 and 15,000 years ago. The stag skulls are extraordinary boasting the largest antlers of any deer that has ever existed. This is what all the fuss has been about, a male Irish elk. This animal had antlers which weighed about 40 kilos and measured in large specimens 12 feet from end to end. I could stretch myself along the antlers from one tip to the other twice. No modern animal comes close. To find out how it coped with such a massive burden, Tom needs to examine a fully assembled skeleton. It's clear that the Irish elk had specialized, evolving a physique capable of supporting its vast antlers. There's a massive rib cage. And this, in life, of course, supported a very large heart and very large lungs. And this is what we would expect for an animal that had a lifestyle like giant deer an open plains runner, uh, probably high stamina, and this essentially is typical of an aerobic machine. And now we come to the more spectacular end of the animal, where we find the antlers. And quite apart from being extremely heavy, they're also extremely awkward, because a lot of the weight is a long way away from the center of the animal's body. So it's like holding very large buckets at arm's length and trying to maneuver them. It puts a lot of torsion and stresses on its neck. And for that reason, the vertebrae in its neck are very large, quite strong, to try and cope with the stresses and strains of moving this great weight about. Behind the neck, the spines on the vertebrae are very, very tall. And in life, these would have acted as anchor points for a system of cables, ligaments, which ran from here to the neck and helped the animal to raise it and move it around. Antlers place a further demand on a deer. It must shed and regrow them each year. So how did the Irish elk fuel the growth of their unusually massive antlers? What did they eat? Tom Hayden is looking for clues amongst the teeth of a mature stag skull. These white enamel ridges have very, very fine scratches. And there is only one substance we know about which will produce these scratches, and that is grass. Grass has silica particles in between the cells which act like sandpaper as far as the teeth are concerned. And if you look at the enamel on a giant deer and compare it to the enamel on a cow, they're identical. So this is strong evidence to suggest that they ate mainly grass. Pollen samples reveal late Ice Age Ireland was an open treeless landscape. 
its abundant grasslands rich in nutrients like calcium. A perfect environment for the bulk grass feeding the Irish elk's antlers require. Back in the 19th century, Charles Darwin's detractors seized upon these antlers to attack his heretical theory of natural selection. If the survival of the fittest really designed animals to survive, what possible advantage could such an extravagant burden provide? They used the Irish elk to cast doubt on Darwin's theory. To this day, researchers continue to question how natural selection could have produced such large antlers. Why invest so much in them? What was their purpose? Paleontologist Adrian Lister believes that today's fallow deer can provide vital clues. The bucks have got their antlers about half grown, but you can already see the way the antlers grow horizontally out from the head, just like in the Irish elk. There they go. He's conducted anatomical studies that have thrown up a surprising result. They reveal the tiny fallow deer is a distant cousin of the Irish elk. The Irish elk has got particularly strongly developed neck vertebrae, which were to hold up the very heavy head with the weight of the antlers. And the fallow deer, if we look at the neck vertebrae, have got the same structures, although of course they haven't got such heavy antlers now. They've got the similar structure and that proves the relationship but can the fallow deer provide an insight into how Irish elk stags use their vast antlers? Sex may provide the answer. Fallow deer have a mating system called lecking, in which females move among the stags and choose their mate on the merits of his antlers. In the fallow deer, the male will do a kind of display, moving his head from side to side, and he's got these flattened palmations of the antlers which will be shown off in that way to the female who's following on behind him. With the Irish elk, with the uh, flattened parts going straight out horizontally like that and also being so large, uh, maybe the animal didn't have to do that kind of behaviour. Just standing there uh, would have been impressive enough. If the female was interested enough, then mating would ensue. The huge palms of the stag's antlers flash like mirrors across the open landscape attracting a female willing to mate. For females, the choice is simple because for them, bigger antlers indicate a fitter male. So the genes of large antlered males were continually passed on. Sexual selection was driving the development of these enormous antlers. For over a hundred years, scientists denied the antlers could have any other role. Now biomechanics expert Andrew Kitchener can prove they were also deadly weapons. What my research has shown is that the antlers are not just designed for display. There's too much material in here to just be used as an elaborate advertisement hoarding. They're designed for fighting, both at the structural level as to how they actually fit together, and also at the mechanical level. They are actually strong enough to take the massive forces that would have been produced in fighting. The highest density of bone occurs where the antlers impact and lock together. From his observations of other deer, Andrew has demonstrated how these points, known as tines, could be used for defense and attack. In the mating season, stags challenge each other for the right to mate. At first, the stags size each other up. But what would happen if battle commenced? The next stage would be to twist the head right round, drop it down to the ground so that the nose points back between the front legs. And now you can see the different parts of the antler coming into function for fighting. Here we have 
the brow tines and also these secondary tines, which act in a defensive way. They protect the head and the eye from accidental injury if the antlers were to slip against each other. And on the outside, on the palms here, we have these very long offensive tines which point in towards the neck and the flank of the opponent. And during fighting, the aim is to try and wrestle your opponent off balance and hopefully knock him over so that you can use these ties to actually stab your opponent in the flank or the neck. Andrew's research revealed stag fights would have been brutal and violent. <laughs> This stag has proved he is the alpha male and secured his access to the females. In attracting a mate and fighting off rivals, the antlers were the key to passing on an individual stag's genes. But could this design have also brought the Irish elk's downfall? Carbon dating of the Dublin bones reveals that 10,500 years ago, it vanished from Ireland. Why, just as the Ice Age was ending and conditions improved, did the Irish elk face extinction? Eleven thousand years ago, the Ice Age was coming to an end. Rising global temperatures pushed back the icy tundra that had stretched across northern Europe. In Ireland, the Irish elk, a giant deer with vast antlers, had evolved to graze the rich Ice Age grassland. Irish elk were once plentiful. Over a hundred individuals have been excavated from one peat bog alone. But around 10,600 years ago, the fossil record reveals the Irish elk disappeared suddenly and completely. What caused this catastrophic decline? Geologist Pete Coxon is trying to find out. He's investigating what happened to the local climate in Ireland at the end of the Ice Age. Almost three meters below the surface, he finds soil which dates back 11,000 years to the late Ice Age, when the Irish Elk was still thriving. These late Ice Age soils are rich in pollen. They show it was cooler than today, but there was abundant grassland. You see organic sediment being laid down with seeds and bits of leaf and so on. And in this core, we can even pick out fragments of, of, of plant, fossils of plant. There's some cuticle there of a, of a grass or a sedge. When Pete takes a sample from slightly higher up and 400 years later, the very end of the Ice Age, there's a dramatic change. The grass pollen has been replaced by eroded rock and sand. For Pete, it's evidence of an unexpected climate change that wiped out vegetation. We see in this section this very sudden cold snap. You see sand and inorganic material in here. You get a lot of erosion, a lot of uh, movement of soil down the slope, and that's why we see these inorganic sediments. And this cold snap lasted a thousand years. Um, temperatures seven degrees colder than the present day. Suddenly, the biological productivity plummets. Ironically, as the rest of the world warmed up at the end of the Ice Age, Ireland was hit locally by severe cold. It seems to defy logic. But the sea provides an answer. As rising temperatures melted the great polar ice caps, Cold water flooded into the Atlantic Ocean, cooling it by an estimated eight degrees Celsius. Warm Gulf Stream currents flowing up from the tropics were blocked. Ireland lost its central heating and was plunged into freezing conditions. In a severe cold period, stags with smaller antlers, less of a burden, would have had a better chance of surviving. Natural selection would predict they would now be the fittest. But is there any evidence that the Irish elk evolved to become smaller? 
Tom Hayden has measured hundreds of antlers from this crucial period. But he can't find any indication that they were shrinking. Ironically, sexual instinct may have outweighed survival instinct. The Irish elk was caught in a dilemma, in a sense. It was being forced in one direction to maintain large size and large antlers at a very expensive cost by sexual selection. And on the other hand, natural selection would have been dictating a downsizing, a smaller animal, smaller antlers, uh, a less expensive lifestyle. Unfortunately, it couldn't make that transition. In the grip of sudden climate change, it appears the Irish elk could not evolve quickly enough. Ten and a half thousand years ago, the Irish elk succumbed to extinction. For scientists, that's long been the end of the story. But bones stored here are adding a new twist to the case of the Irish elk. They're not from Ireland, they're from the Isle of Man, which was then connected to Britain by a land bridge. In 2000, Adrian Lister started to carbon date Irish elk remains from northern Britain. The result from the Manx skeleton was a bombshell. We've got the radiocarbon dates back from the lab, and amazingly, they show that this Irish elk skull is the latest one that we have from anywhere in the world. This specimen is only 9,200 years old. And so this specimen shows that the species did actually survive for nearly 1,500 years longer than we'd previously imagined. The question is, why? Ireland's cold spell had been severe but local. To the east of Ireland, the Isle of Man and southern Scotland were more sheltered. And Irish elk here must have been able to cling on for another 1,500 years. Yet these late dates mean that the remaining Irish elk may have encountered a new threat. At Edinburgh University, archaeologists are sifting through the debris from a human encampment. Clear evidence that late Stone Age hunters had reached southern Scotland at the same time as the remaining Irish elk were escaping the cold. Did they hunt them down? Intrigued by this possibility, Adrian Lister goes to examine the Edinburgh evidence to search for signs that man hunted the remaining Irish elk. There's a deer tooth, that's a, that's a red deer upper molar. That's a, that's a deer humerus, forearm bone. That's red deer size. That's a little bit of the uh, bottom end of a so-called cannon bone, which is the lower leg bone. Again, that's red deer. There's a clear impression here that red deer is the dominant prey animal. There are plenty of deer bones, but no sign of Irish elk at this site. No hard evidence to point the finger at man. What else could explain the animal's final extinction? Yet again, were its giant antlers implicated? 10,000 years ago, the landscape across Britain and Ireland was transformed once more. It's so dramatic, it's like a light switch clicking on. And instantly, this landscape is warm, the soils begin to form, and any plant that's close by will suddenly be able to colonise that landscape. So by this point, nine and a half thousand years ago, find a piece of pine wood, 
there, you can see the nice bright red colour in, in the bark. And right at the very top of the core here is the shell of part of a hazelnut. Grasslands gave way to forests after the Ice Age. At first, birch, pine and hazel. But by 9,200 years ago, even oak was colonising northern Britain. Ironically, Adrian Lister believes the changing countryside may have brought further problems for the Irish elk. The kind of habitat the Irish elk liked was lots of open grassy areas where it could graze, but it wouldn't have liked the dense forests that started to grow up as the climate warmed in the present interglacial. Uh, dense forests didn't give it the variety of food, especially grass, that it liked. Also, of course, with those very huge antlers, uh, they would have been an encumbrance in the forest and, and also would have put the Irish elk under pressure as its preferred habitat shrunk and shrunk. The warming climate would have sealed the animal's fate. As the ice caps melted, sea levels were rising some 30 feet every thousand years. The Irish Sea was created and new islands like the Isle of Man appeared. The remaining Irish elk were split into small vulnerable groups, literally marooned. This may have had disastrous consequences for the gene pool. If they're in a situation where they can't easily exchange genes between the populations, then the, the relic populations may become inbred and that's not uh, healthy either, especially if they're in a situation where they would need to adapt quite quickly to changing conditions. They may not have the genetic resources to do that. 9,000 years ago, the remaining pockets of Irish elk were on the brink of extinction. It had prospered for tens of thousands of years. But finally, climate change isolated the Irish elk in small populations, struggling in an increasingly forested landscape. Evolution had crafted a highly specialized animal, dependent on open grassland to nourish its extraordinary antlers. Clearly, the general design and lifestyle of the Irish elk was tremendously successful while the going was good. And they, in a sense, specialised for this high life. And then suddenly, when the climate changes, they're almost locked into this expensive lifestyle and they can't pay the bills anymore. The case of the Irish elk reveals that, faced with a changing world, too highly evolved a design can actually prove an animal's undoing. Specialised animals are usually the ones that go to the wall first. The generalists, like the meek, inherit the earth. 